hello artists. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so delighted to have you here either watching this on YouTube or listening to me on the podcast. I know it's been a while since I have delivered an episode, but I was so, so, so inspired by an email I received from an artist that I work with uh, to bring you this very first solo episode today. Our topic today will be about three major mindset shifts for artists. Now, before I get into it, before I tell you what these mindset shifts are, I wanted to share with you how grateful I am to receive this email from this artist about something that's so deeply personal. And also, I wanted to read you a snippet of it. Now, of course, I'm going to keep the identity of this artist super confidential. Uh, so, you know, just obviously. So I'm not going to give you everything, but I'll give you the, you know, the golden nugget of it. Okay. So here we go. Mm -hmm. I had a huge insight into my fears of success. Huge. Years of therapy, and this was new. Thank you so much for bringing it up. It's pretty convoluted. I just try to give you a summary of it, but I'm not ready to articulate. But I think it's one of those linchpin realizations that can allow me to either make the decision to quit, and why would I do that after years of work, or make the decision to clean up my relationship with my own art and take the risks I need to. Deep psychological issue and scary. But I realize it's something that needs, that feels deeply shameful. That I was afraid to know about myself and now I see it and can begin to work on it and change my feeling of not deserving. Three step exercise on naming the fear, prevention steps, and repair are extremely helpful in giving me a procedure on making this transition. Thank you. And I'm always appreciative of the tangible tools and how to steps you give us. But with me, the deeper psychological and spiritual issues that I now see and need to work out are what have prevented me from using these tools. Now, how beautiful is that? And what really inspired me here is to share the mindset shifts that I was working on with this artist with you so that you can start to truly understand how great it is that you're an artist, that you will feel empowered and you will go ahead and use all the tangible tools that I am teaching you uh, as much as you can. Because while I do teach you a lot of tangible tools, there are many, many uh, other intangible feelings that come along with it. And it's important to address them so that you are doing everything with confidence. In an earlier YouTube video, I think I probably released it. Oh gosh, now it's almost two years ago, uh, where I spoke about my method for artists for success. I explained that when I work with artists, the first thing we do is we identify the intention behind the work and we set the goals. And um, the second thing we do is we work on the mindset of the artist to make sure that they're not sabotaging in any way, right? And that they are truly confident and feeling deserving. And then we go in to work on the artist's presentation of their work, their online presence, um, any sort of tools that they uh, need to um, put together for other types of presentation of their work, whether it's you know, via email or a book or whatever, uh, because it's important to have the intention clear. It's important to be in the right mindset before you even work on your presentation, because guess what? You're only going to present the work at the level that you feel it needs to be presented at. 
right? So that's why we work on all of this ahead of time. And then we take action. So I know you're at the edge of your seat. You're wondering, hey, Marina, what are these three mindset shifts you're talking about? Let me spell them out for you and then we'll go into it. So our first mindset shift is releasing the belief that you must be a starving artist if you're going to be an artist, right? So releasing the belief that you are a starving artist. Now, it kind of goes hand in hand with also releasing a belief that you are a hobby artist, which is very similar to the starving artist belief. We'll touch upon that a little bit as well. We'll, we'll say that that's like belief 1A. One, one B, right? Belief 1A and 1B, starving artist and hobby artist. We're going to release those beliefs today. And yeah, we are. We are totally going to release those beliefs because why not? Um, and then our second mindset shift is believing and feeling like you are deserving of what you want. Because if you don't, believe you deserve it, guess what? You're not going to get it. You will only get what you feel you deserve. So we're going to talk about that as well. And our third mindset shift is releasing fear, right? And it's going to start with releasing the fear of rejection. And we'll talk about that a little bit longer as well, you know, because Ultimately, you know, I don't know if you're going to get to the end of this episode, but I bet you will, right? But if you don't, the one thing I want you to take away here from this is that you are the only one who can reject yourself. Okay. Rejection is at the very core is only important when you are the one who's rejecting yourself. And we'll also go into this three-step exercise that this artist was uh, writing to me about that helped them so much. It's a three-part exercise by Tim Ferriss, who is a motivational speaker about fear setting, about figuring out what your fear is and releasing it, okay? So let's get into it. Let's go into the very first mindset shift that we're going to have, okay? First mindset shift is releasing this belief that you are a inevitably going to be a starving artist, right? Now, where does this belief come from? It comes from growing up and hearing that, hey, you know, if you want to be an artist, that's cool. You should maybe consider that as a hobby because artists don't make money and you might as well just go and be a doctor or a lawyer or, and, you know, something tangible, something that's in demand because art is not in demand. And that's why, you know, it's so hard to be an artist. Now, this is something that is so personal to me too, because I grew up in an immigrant family. As a matter of fact, we came here in the, we came to New York City from the Soviet Union in the early 90s. I'm from Ukraine. Uh, and my grandparents raised me. My grandparents lived through World War II as Jews in Europe. So I totally don't blame them for this because they were really doing uh, exactly what it is that they're supposed to be doing, which is watching out for me, but they had these beliefs from a totally different time. And my mom as well, she had very similar beliefs um, from, again, a totally different time and place. Uh, we are now living in a world where art is so crucial for people, right? And back then it wasn't. So I mean, it was, but not to the scale that it is now. Think about how much more time everyone is spending at home now than they did before. I mean, people are working from home, right? There was this huge pandemic. I don't know if we like totally remember it, but <laughs> anyway, there's this huge pandemic and all these people are working at home and 
all of a sudden they're looking at their walls, they're looking at their surroundings, they're those that are able to, they're redecorating, they are buying art and art on all scales and levels and price points. So really, really, it is so much more valuable uh, for you. Well, I don't want to say valuable, but okay, sure. It's so much more valuable for you to know now how important and in demand art is. But even before the pandemic, right, we could say that this belief that if you're an artist, you are going to be a starving artist is incorrect. Okay. And I can tell you because I've seen it firsthand. I've worked with artists that sell their paintings for six figures. Okay. And you might not even know who they are if I told you their names because they're not as famous as Jeff Koons. And what's important is that you don't have to be that famous to make an impact and to sell your work at a high price. You just have to be with the right audience. Right. So truly releasing this belief uh, and understanding that, you know, just because you're an artist doesn't mean you have to be starving, okay? You can make a really handsome living as an artist, but only if you feel like it's possible and that you deserve it, right? And we're going to talk about that as well. But this belief of being a starving artist, this is something that I'm sure you have heard growing up. You know, I'm sure this is something that um, your parents probably told you or your teachers or you've heard it kind of echoing. And it is something that is so vital for you to believe, uh, of release the belief of, right? It's so vital for you to release this because if you believe it, you're going to have thoughts, automatic thoughts that influence how you're going to act in life, what you're going to do, that are going to sabotage anything that is on the contrary of that belief. So if you really believe, right, if you're conditioned to believe that if you're an artist, you're going to be a starving artist, so you could find ways to not sell your work. As a matter of fact, you might think that it's okay to sell your work <laughs> that you made um, so diligently for just a few hundred dollars when it's worth a few thousand dollars or more, right? So believing that you will be a starving artist if you're an artist, this is something that we need to let go of. So one thing that I can tell you is the most important thing is where in your day-to-day -day life, do you see that you are sabotaging making money as an artist, right? Are you not answering an inquiry? Are you not following up to an inquiry that you receive? Are you not even making the offer or telling people that the work is available or showing that it's available? Now, of course, I really uh, advise you to be... Uh, mindful when you tell people that your work is available. So don't just have everything available on your website if you want to work with a gallery, because then you're truly competing with the gallery. And there are so many, it's kind of like a case by case basis on telling people whether or not the work is available and what the price is. But really think to yourself if someone is inquiring, are you? answering that inquiry in a way where you feel empowered and like the work is deserving of being sold? Or are you saying something like, oh, I'll give you 100% off, just take it, <laughs> you know? Really think about that. Now, the second mindset shift comes from this starving artist belief, right? Because when you have this starving artist belief, what happens is you start to think, hey, I don't deserve to sell. I don't deserve to show anywhere. I don't deserve to be part of the conversation. I don't deserve gallery representation. You can go um, snowball into a big undeserving avalanche, right? 
we don't want to do that. So, because you will get what you think you deserve. I know, mind blowing, but truly you will get what you think you deserve. And so it's really valuable for you to know your self-worth, how hard you have worked to get to where you are and truly feel like you deserve what you want. Now, an exercise that I will suggest to you, just so you can see where you're not deserving certain things. And let me tell you, when you feel like you don't deserve it, you will almost, I mean, you might short circuit in your mind where you're thinking, how could I possibly deserve this? I just can't, cannot compute, right? So here's a little exercise that I want you to do. Make two columns, right? In the first column, you'll write down what you deserve. And the second column is what other artists deserve, okay? And now what are those categories that you're going to write about? So there should be a category on how often you show, how much you sell your work for, how often you sell your work, uh, whether, you know, you feel like you deserve recognition, acknowledgement, uh, press, um, residencies, awards, and all of these things versus other artists, right? So if there, if you make these two columns and there's a huge disparity in what you think you deserve versus what other artists deserve, then you need to work on some deservingness. And working on that deservingness, again, comes deeply from within you. It really comes from understanding your true value, your self-worth, and how important you are. Um, now, there is probably, oh, sorry, excuse me. There is probably going to be a feeling that you get where you're wondering, hey, is this deservingness or is this entitlement? I know that's a feeling that I got when I thought about this at first, because I thought, hey, you know, I don't want to be entitled. I want to work hard. And this is something, you know, when you're raised thinking that you need to have a super strong work ethic where you have to work really hard to, you know, put food on the table. Uh, this really comes from scarcity and lack, right? And that's kind of, you know, unfortunately how I was raised. Um, but again, I'm not going to go into that too much because I've been working on letting go of these beliefs right now in our society with all that's going on. Uh, I got to say, I feel so grateful that I pretty much live in the lap of luxury compared to how my grandparents um, were living and certainly how things are going right now in my um, home country, right? So I feel very, very lucky. And you should too, if you're in a space where you're not worried about being you know, bombed. Um, so anyway, <laughs> real talk. So that entitlement, right? That feeling of entitlement can come up for you if you've been raised to think that you need to have a super strong work ethic. And that's not necessarily something that we fully need to have right now. You just need to work smarter, not harder. And releasing that fear of entitlement it's super important for you to understand exactly what you feel you deserve, because I can't say it enough. You will only get what you want if you think you deserve it. Okay, so this is a big one to work on. Now, the third mindset shift that I want you to have is truly to release fear of rejection, because um, when you release that fear of rejection and anything that comes up around it or any fear, really, then you're capable of taking the risks that are going to get you places, right? You're capable of giving it a try, giving it a shot, because guess what? You might think, hey, I'm not going to apply for this residency because what if I don't get in? Well, you're an artist. Guess what? 
if you don't apply, you'll definitely not get in, right? So being able to take that risk is so, so important. So the three-step exercise that this artist uh, who wrote me this email was talking about is an exercise uh, by this motivational speaker and entrepreneur. His name is Tim Ferriss, and it's a three-step exercise on removing fears. He calls it fear setting, and he's got a great TED talk about it, but it's super, super helpful because a lot of our anxieties come from this place of where we feel like, you know, something can go wrong or you did something wrong. So let's dispel all of that. So let me tell you what this exercise is. Now, wait a minute, before I get into it, I want to tell you something else. I want to tell you that the biggest, biggest fear of all is arguably the fear of rejection. And this fear is kind of interesting because ultimately you're the only one who can truly reject you and yourself, right? You're the only one who can reject you. No one else. We have this huge fear of rejection because millennia ago, when our ancestors were living in caves and hunting and living in these, um, you know, we're before the ice age, right? We wouldn't be able to survive on our own. As a matter of fact, if we went out on our own, if we were cast out from our communities, we would probably starve to death or be eaten by a wild animal or something like that. So the fear of rejection is one that is rooted so, so deeply in us because we're truly afraid of rejection as much as we're afraid of losing our lives because millennia ago, that was the thing. You would truly lose your life if you were rejected. This isn't exactly the case now when you're applying to a group show. So it's okay. You can apply to a group show. And if you don't get in, hey, that's cool. As long as you are truly happy with what you're doing, you are going to find the group show for you, right? You're going to find the audience, the community, the place for you, and you won't feel uh, that fear when you're being rejected. And maybe you won't even get rejected, you know, uh, but it's something for you to consider. Uh, and this is a big, big thing, right? Now, this, this three-step exercise that I'm kind of, um, putting off telling you about because I'm so worried I'm going to screw it up. Ah, so let's practice this. All right. I'm going to put this into practice. Uh, but as an example of showing you this fear setting exercise, but anyway, so this is how you do it. Okay. And now we hear a siren outside my building. I don't know if you guys can hear it on the recording, but I always say, Whenever there is a siren, it's a sign from the universe that whatever you're saying is super important. So it's like an alarm saying like, wake up, listen. So, okay. The fear setting exercise. Here's what it is. You make three columns. In the first column, you list your fears. In the second column, you list how you can prevent the fearful thing from happening, right? And in the third column, you list the way that you can repair the thing if it happened, the fear if it happened, right? Well, let me make this easy. I was gonna maybe use my fear of telling you about this exercise as an example, but then I thought, wait, it's gonna get too meta. It's gonna be confusing, right? So, Let's talk about a fear that we might have. Thinking, what's a fear? Now, of course, when I'm on the spot, I can't think of any fears. I'm fearless. Um, <laughs> unless they're very esoteric, and then I can't really give you a good example. All right. Let's say um, the fear is leaving a candle lighting you don't want to the fear is I don't want to light my candle here we go 
I don't want to light my candle because I'm afraid that I'm going to burn the house down. All right. Plausible fear. So the prevention of the fear is to, let's say I could set an alarm when I light my candle for, you know, an hour from now to turn the candle off, to snuff it out, right? That, that would be the prevention, right? Now the repair, let's say I forget to, um, I totally forget about my candle and I forget about the alarm and it keeps going. How can I repair it? If it starts to, you know, how can I repair the damage of the fire? Oh my God. Oh, wow. Boy, did I pick an interesting fear. Well, I could, um, I guess, put the candle out, put the fire out. See, this is not an easy exercise. And I was truly fearful of telling you about it because it was like, how am I going to demonstrate this for them? In Tim Ferriss' TED Talk, he talks about a letter that he forgets to mail to the IRS. Um, and it's much easier to deal with that so than the candle analogy. But anyway, maybe you can comment below or send me a message about how I could repair <laughs> my house being um, burnt down by a candle. Um, whew, interesting. I guess really how I could repair that is I could have really good fire insurance for my house. <laughs> oh my God. Where am I going with this episode? Really? Anyway, I wanted you to see uh, the truly candid me because here's the thing. If it's perfect the first time you do it, like a solo podcast episode or recording anything or making the artwork, then you waited too long, right? Because you're perfect, right? So there's no room for improvement. Um, but anyway, hope this was interesting for you. And just want to recap these three very powerful mindset shifts that you should have, consider having as an artist. Number one is releasing the belief that you have to be a starving artist. Number two is feeling deservingness for what you want. Because if you do not feel like you deserve something, you're probably not going to get it. And the third shift is releasing fear. So use this exercise um, by Tim Ferriss. So write down your fear, how you can prevent it from happening and what you can do to repair the thing, you know, from happening. Uh, I actually just thought of something. So if my fear is screwing up the last section of the podcast, what I could do is I could write down an outline for myself so that I don't screw it up. And the repair would be if I do screw it up, just re-record it. Now, I don't want to do that. I want to be super authentic with you. Um, yeah, because you know what? Now you know what not to do with this exercise. <laughs> Don't think about your fear of lighting your house on fire with a candle. Yeah, weird. Okay, so moving on. I hope you enjoy this podcast episode. If you are watching this on YouTube, please leave a like, a comment, subscribe, you know, tell everyone you know about it if you like it. And uh, if you're listening to this as a podcast, then please, please, please uh, rate the podcast, you know, preferably five stars and uh, let me know uh, and others know how much you loved it by leaving a review. So thank you so much and I'll see you next time.